it's your boy C Boss. Welcome back to the show. We're coming to you live from 1999. And you already know on this show, we are about the three B's the bling, booyah, and the bomb.com. And if you don't know what that means, <laughs> <laughs> you old bitch, Quack. you mom and dad. So you might have heard about this little thing called Y2K, the supposed computer error that could take down the entire world. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you telling me those egghead scientist guys can't count to 100? Even I can do that. One, two, three. Skate break! <laughs> So if some science guy comes up to you in a big old hazmat suit talking to you about the end of the world, you just tell him, don't go there. I was wrong. We're all gonna die. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explain, we're taking it all the way back to the wacky turn of the millennium in 1999 with VHS 99. In this installment, we witnessed a hellish version of 1999 as social isolation, analog technology, and disturbing home videos fuse into a nightmare of found footage savagery. As we know by now with the VHS series, and indeed all anthology films, some segments are going to be stronger than others. With 99, it feels like more misses than hits, but there are a few this stand out. I also do wish that the segments actually felt more connected to the Y2K craze, turn of the millennium aspect, when really only one ties its story directly to the date. Many are the expected kind of standard stories from the series and could have been set in any year. Also, the segments start feeling a bit similar as well. The standout by far is the creative Double Dare inspired Ozzy's Dungeon from Flying Lotus. It stands out with its televised style and just overall insanity that unfortunately feels lacking from most of the proceedings. So let's check out VHS. VHS 99, breaking down each segment and their endings along with how it all ties together. Static of a VHS tape gives way to a home video of a kid playing with army men, voicing the various soldiers. Their German prisoner of war requests some cigarettes or even just a rifle, but he's reminded he's not on their side. So no, they can't be friends. They just want to kill all Germans, pointing to a pile of bodies nearby, saying with no remorse, he'd do it again. The lazy Johnson then takes a joyride in the tank, steamrolling over the entire crew. Whoops, way to go. Johnson. Various broadcasts tear through the static, settling in on a girl taping herself in a reflection. It's too good, she chuckles. Rachel meets with the rest of her punk band Rack, introduced via a perfectly late 90s kind of sitcom intro, showing them practicing their pop punk and generally being terrible at skateboarding. She welcomes us to the latest episode of their show, Fuck Shit Up, where they're about to partake in a special mission, busting into an abandoned club called The Colony Underground. It was a weird art collective that featured hella shows all the time with big names in the genre. They too would have loved to play there if not for the tragic electric fire that happened there three years ago on this very day. The only deaths were the band that headlined that night, Bitch Cat. They were only burned to a crisp after being trampled to death by their own fans. Rachel laughs it off, but Anchor looks terrified. Their demo reel is played with the girls touting they make their own sound. Not some corporate BS, y'all. They want their shows to be a big party with everyone welcome. And sure, why not have a mosh pit or two. What's a party without a little violence? They all chant together play or die and scream in unison. Before they head to the cursed venue, Anchor wants to stop by his house. Rachel confronts him over some spices that he picked up, wanting to know why he's such a scared little baby. You really think you're gonna see some ghosts? Man, these guys are annoying. They keep prodding him and Anchor lashes out understandably. And these morons definitely don't know what they're getting into here. They arrive at the venue and Anchor is even more concerned. The girls seem nice. They don't want to mess with their gravesite. The others are argue that it's good for the video and sounds cool. He warns of Boots from Hindu stories, restless spirits with unfinished business. If someone bothers them, they will possess you, he claims. They still aren't listening, ripping on him once more for bringing his supposed ghost killing spices. Inside, Rach welcomes the viewers to what's left of the club, really surprised that everyone made it out alive. Just had a sacrifice bitch cat to do so. Herd mentality, man, someone scoffs. Cheap, you know. They navigate the dark area, a complete maze of hallways. They spot some food and blankets 
it's looking like someone actually lives down here. They open another door, despite Anchor encouraging to leave it alone. Inside, a shrine of shorts has been erected, along with a book there and the phrase passing from death to life highlighted. Of course, the others can't help but disrupt the display, making the trinkets hump each other. Yeah, that's good content. There's a boot straight up melted to the ground, which they presume belonged to a band member. Down the hall, another guy gets yanked away, shouting for help. They arrive at the stage, seeing Anchor's drum kit ready to go, and the others reveal it's all a joke at his expense. They get ready to jam, imparting the wise words to try not to suck. Yeah, right. The noodling begins, and the band suddenly stops, convulsing and groaning. Anchor yells to cut it out. If this is another joke, I'm gonna kill y'all. It naturally was another prank, condemning Anchor for being so predictable. He's pissed, grumpily staying silent. They try to downplay it all as just messing around. Rach herself takes responsibility, even giving him a half-hearted apology, only to follow it with more harsh words. Terrible friends. Anchor curses them to be taken by the boots and leaves. The others do a test to find out the answer to an age-old question, just how hard is it really to crush four chicks to death? They set out blow-up bodies filled with jello and pounce on them, unleashing the sticky goo within. Their stupidity is interrupted by loud feedback, along with banging, which they dismiss as nothing. The feedback grows louder, and a voice yells for them to get off my stage. One dude is lit into the air and comes back down in a rain of gore and body parts. Looks like Bitch Cat have finally had enough of their disrespect. The singer takes over the camera, seeing the other members looming nearby bathed in red light. They reunite and do their play or die chant once more. They then turn on the band, disemboweling the dude in a dress. The ghoul takes a moment to check herself out in a mirror, hearing whimpering behind her. The rest of the band shuffles in, and Anchor desperately tells him to return to the resting place. He tosses some of his secret herbs and spices on him, causing the ghoul's flesh to sizzle. But it's no use. Rachel yells for help, and the ghouls soon find her, hearing more screams screeching and flesh being torn, and her body parts are launched at the wall. The girls more than live up to their motto, making the kids both die and play. They proceed to reassemble their body parts, the band now weird, fleshy Muppets. As Anchor warned, they disturbed their graves and now their bits have been possessed. The now possessed band start a rockin', their parts all comically bobbing around. We briefly return to the kid with army toys. One soldier parachutes in, finding himself in a strange environment. It's even more frightening than he could have expected, as a piece of paper origamis into a bird that attacks him. Our next tale is all about college freshman Lily, who is desperate to be a member of the Beta Sigma Eta sorority. She prattles on about the moment she walked into the house. She felt like she was home, calling them her soul sisters already. Her friend Ellen enters and is concerned about her only pledging one house, a so-called unaliving bid. Can't say that other word anymore. The problem is if you only apply for one house and get rejected, you're kicked from the whole entire process, spending the year as an outcast. Oh no, an outcast from sororities. What am I going to do? Helen is also unsure why Lily is taking a risk on those girls and implies that they look down on them when giving them the tour. She poses to Lily. Would they actually say yes to people like us? Well, no, not us. She snickers, meaning that she thinks she is above her bud. A few days later, it looks like her risky bid did pay off and the sorority girls take her out to party. But the fact that they get Lily incredibly wasted probably doesn't bode well for their intentions here. It certainly doesn't help their case when they take her to a mausoleum slash church of some sort. They gush over her message, we're soul sisters, right? And all the girls agree in unison. As for what they're doing here, Annie fills her in on the legend of Guillotine. She was a young freshman 20 years ago and was desperate to join a sorority just like Lily. The sisters took her to a graveyard and was told that in order to join the gang was forced to spend the night in a coffin. Cruelly, the girls left her down there for a whole week. And curiously, when they did finally dig her up, there was no one in there. No one knows what happened exactly, but the story goes that Guillotine crawled right through the earth into the underworld. Sometimes they say you can still hear her knocking, waiting for someone to come and take back with her to play with in the afterlife. I think you can see where this is going, and the girls urge her to take another big ol' swig of liquor. Get that judgment nice and impaired. They bring her outside for a surprise, and when you know it, they want her to spend the night in a coffin just like the ill-fated girl. They do promise it will be a blast, and claim that they all did it themselves. Sure you did. It's not even that bad, they say. There's enough air down there for 24 hours, and they got a bell that she can dingle on in case of emergency. However, if she doesn't last the whole time, she will not be allowed into the sorority. And another girl gives her a box that she promises will help her, along with a camera, naturally. Oh, and as a final warning, if you hear knocking down there, don't do anything, or Gilly will grab you down to the afterlife. Lily climbs down into place, the girls cheering her on, and get the lid closed up. They chant something about moist earth, took away father, and 
dead mother. Then take me also, for I am very lonely. Sounds to me like they're doing some kind of specific chant to call forth the girl's spirit. Yeah, thanks a ton, ladies. They bid her nighty-night and begin filling the grave with dirt, soon covering her in complete darkness. Lily clicks on the camera and tries to convince herself not to panic. This is all just for show. However, it doesn't take long for fear to set in, along with some tears. She laughs nervously, addressing Helen. If only she could see her now. She tentatively grabs the rope and, showing that she might be a mean girl at her core, scorns Helen. That's what you want me to do, right? To fail like you. Sad and alone, wishing boys could ask you out. She sneers. I'm not like you. I'm like them. Well, at least she admits it, but mm, that's not really a good thing. They're scraping and banging on the lid, and she goes right for the rope. It's just the girls up above laughing about how terrified she is. Lily opens the box, unleashing several spiders crawling all over the tight area. Yeah, real helpful. One goes right onto her face, and she slaps it away, smashing another. She's had enough, and tugs vigorously on the rope, begging to be let out. Thunder crashes, and the girls all cheer. Lily starts really freaking, doing her darndest to get out of this predicament. The girls ignore the ringing bell, but the fun is cut short, seeing police sirens approaching. Rather than risk getting caught, they decide to leave Lily behind, promising to come back tomorrow. She keeps banging on the lid, but now is on her own. Even worse, the rain causes a mudslide pouring right into the coffin. Potentially facing death, she tries to reconcile with Helen, apologizing for what she said. After everything, she realizes she was her one true friend. It admits that she doesn't even know why she wanted to fit in with these girls in the first place. Should have figured that one out earlier. The coffin groans, and water starts really streaming in, quickly filling the box. Soon, only her head remains above water, hearing pounding and someone prying at the lid. It's Giltine! Growling right on the other side of the cross. She breaks through, reaching out for Lily, and vanishes. She's in inside with her, crawling right up on top of her, Lily screaming for dear life. The camera gets distorted and cuts away. Another one outside fast forwards several hours to the morning when the girls do surprisingly return. Seeing the grave filled with water, they assume that it is too late. One girl, Imogene, dives into the murky water anyway, finding the coffin empty. What? Some consider perhaps it was guillotine, but they argue that's just a story and agree to cover up what happened, never speaking of it again. Retribution comes quickly for the girls, however, as they each wake up in their own respective coffins. Ghost Lily appears, explaining that she made a deal with Guillotine to let her go if she gets enough sisters to have a sorority of her own. Afterlife sorority, exclusive. Guillotine is there too, and the girls shriek, knowing that there is no escape. Back with the army dudes, they are doing their best to fend off a big monster. Another monster appears, grabbing a soldier and tears him in half. The others rush to his side, and he wants to know if he's gonna die. They stammer, uh, yeah, you're gonna be just fine. Well, then why can't I feel my legs? It's getting dark, so dark, and the plastic man fades away. The commander is notably disappointed, urging everyone else to not get bitten in half, okay? And probably the most entertaining and bizarre of the bunch, we are treated to a broadcast of the not exactly kid-friendly competition show, Ozzy's Dungeon, an obvious riff on Nickelodeon's Double Dare. After the intro involving some fly honeys and a skeezy host is complete, we learn what's at stake for the winner. They can grant you any wish your heart desires. All you gotta do is make it through the obstacle course and into Ozzy's Dungeon. It's quickly clear how unsafe the show is. In the first game, the kid's only trying to pop balloons. Regardless, one kid gets injured, and a first aid team drags him away on a stretcher, only to drop him again on the way out. The host assures the audience that he'll be okay, eventually. We then meet one contestant, Donna, and the host makes it clear how hard the next challenge is. Not many have made it through. In fact, no one has. She is still confident that she can do it. Her family always told her she could do anything she puts her mind to. The host asks what her wish is, but the footage glitches before we hear her answer. It's then down to the final two contestants, Donna and Timmy from Los Angeles, and they have to face the dreaded obstacle course, taking them right through Ozzy's body itself. In order to win, they need to make it through all the orifices in 60 seconds, collecting hidden red flags along the way. Mark Summers will be proud, or more likely disgusted. The clock starts, and Timmy trips immediately, giving Donna a big lead. She slides down the throat, digging for the flag, with Timmy nipping at her heels. He catches up, both collecting two flags. They tussle their way through the intestine, and Donna's leg is severely injured. Her mom wants to step in to help, but the others hold her back, and time runs out. Her mom is livid, and the tape begins to replay that painful moment over and over. Static takes over, and we then find ourselves in what looks like a garage. There's glimpses of what appear to be knockoff versions of the obstacles, and see that they have kidnapped the host, locking him up in a cage. Donna's mom clearly blames him for Donna's injury, seeing that she is now wheelchair-bound. Still, the host doesn't even remember her. Besides, they signed a waiver, so it's not his problem. Mom growls, no one cares about a waiver, and gets so flustered she has to remove her shirt. Ah, we've all been there. She accuses him of creating an impossible obstacle course that ruined Donna's life. She was supposed to 
be the star of the family to get them out of here. She shows off the leg, and he's confused why it looks that bad. Hmm. She yells that it looks like dog meat, and he concurs. The host assures them that the show wasn't rigged, but Mama does not believe him. And now it's time for the host to get a taste of his own medicine. Her son retrieves a bottle of green liquid, which Mom shows off as acid. They tie him to a pole and welcome him to his first challenge. She counts down, and her burly son tackles him, tearing his side open. For round two, they throw hunks of raw meat at him. Come and catch it, puppy, they tease. The host cries that he is trying, and Mom helps him out by rubbing the raw meat all over his face, and the host immediately spits up in disgust. Then it's time for the main event, the obstacle course. He gets to his feet weekly, spotting a sweet tramp stamp. Nice, buddy. He's curious what the brown stuff is in one obstacle, and Mom laughs that it sure ain't bean dip. What if he doesn't finish, he asks, and Mom holds out the acid. That's all he needs to know. The clock starts, and he brutally treks to the course, crying the whole time that he can't do it. He manages to find the flag and slips into the pool, declaring, I did it! I won your stupid game! Mama lets him down with a head shake. Shoot, you were just a few seconds too late. So they get a syringe filled with acid ready, and the host pleads with him. He can help get her wish granted still. They thought that Ozzy's was canceled, but he knows where it is. Just about to jam the needle right into his eye, he swears that he can take them to it. They all load up in the family car for an awkward car ride back to the studio. Noticing new security posted out, they sneak around to the back. There they wander through the old set, wondering if they should even trust this guy, but they know that this is where they have to be. He knocks on a big wooden door, and the warrior co-host lady is there to greet him with a torch. And Mama is hopeful she's finally going to get that wish. She feels her way through the darkness, the host realizing this is actually a cave. He's never been past the door before, so he has no idea what's in store here. Mama still isn't worried. Nothing in there is meaner than her. The host stops them and whispers something into the girl's ear. He claims that Ozzy knows his aura and wheels Donna deeper inside. They come to an odd setup with candles and a bloated figure lying within. He tells her to make the wish a good one and wheels her right up to the woman. She whispers something to her and places a hand on her massive tummy. Thunder starts cracking, alarming the family. The woman's stomach splits open and a horrific tentacle monster with a glowing eye emerges. Uh, is that Ozzy, I guess? The eye starts shooting out purple and black symbols and runes all over the walls. It turns into a straight up laser beam. The host shrieks and his face melts away. The same goes for the rest of the family. Mama's last word demanding to know what the hell Donna did. As she is the only survivor, it appears that her wish was to be rid of her family. Her mama certainly seems like a lot, to say the least, kidnapping and torturing people. And I can't help but wonder if she used that acid on her daughter's leg wound to make it appear worse, because it wouldn't look like that otherwise. This would help us to understand why she was totally cool with her whole fam melting into pudding. What's more with the army guys, we learn of the person behind the lens, Brady, who has apparently been using his older bro Dylan's camera without permission. He snatches it back with obviously much more important things to film, like practicing pickup lines and flexing in the mirror. His macho act is thwarted when his mom calls out asking what he wants for lunch. Dylan's shouting back, Hot Pockets, of course. Oh, you're a big boy, aren't you? Dylan meets up with his bros, indulging in classic pranks like drawing a penis on a sleeping guy, or hiding a camera and a sad excuse to get some covert footage of girls. Their attention is drawn to the new neighbor across the street, Sandra, found sunbathing in her pool. They continue filming her house, watching her washing her car, declaring that she has officially made it into the top three of his spank bank. Wow, what an honor. Sandra bends over, causing the boys to completely lose their minds. Oh, teenage hormones. Brady comes in wanting to see what the commotion is about, and is unceremoniously kicked out of the room for being a dweeb. Their spy games are foiled when a delivery van pulls up right in front of her, blocking the view. He unloads the computer and does a fumbled attempt to hit on her, but Sandra doesn't appear interested. Despite the strikeout, on his own, he does a small victory dance to himself. They continue their stakeout into the night, curious about some weird stone statues out front. Perhaps she's European. They're about to strike pubescent pay dirt when Sandra starts going for the shower, only to close the curtains. Show's over, boys. The next day, Brady is out front learning to rollerblade, the others ripping on him for looking like a dork. He notices Sandra taking out the trash, and the boys worry that he's gonna snitch. To their shock, she takes him by the arm and leads him inside. The boys are dumbfounded. Turns out your nerdy brother is a pimp. Brady returns home, greeted to a barrage of questions about Sandra. He's supposed to help her set up a webcam the next day. This gives his bro an idea. When he's over there, they can install a spyware program. Spy into the next level, bro. Brady is hesitant to do so, worried that if he gets caught, she'll kill him. The boys push him, enticing him that he would be a legend and even offer for him to hang out. With that, he's in, boys. He goes over for the operation and see him through the window as he gets the camera set up. Sandra leaves to another room, giving him the perfect opportunity to initiate the backdoor spyware. The lights shut off in the other room, and she goes to return to Brady. The others worried he's about to get caught. Luckily, she only hands him a beverage, and it looks like he got the job.
job done. They check it out and they are in. They toast in celebration. The kid really did it. Brady is not a kid anymore. He's a man now and has even bestowed his own brewski. Later, they are mostly asleep, but one kid on watch duty rouses the others. DEFCON 5, people. It's shower time. No curtains this time either. She starts undressing and Brady grows uncomfortable, feeling this is a bit creepy. His bro argues that it's just some fun, but Brady wants him to shut it off. He dismisses they will in a little while and soon regrets the choice. Sandra's arm snaps in a strange manner and she removes her hair, revealing a Medusa-like headpiece of snakes. She turns right towards the house and stares right at the boys. They yell to call everyone. There's a girl with snakes on her head. Ah! They hear her screeching and rustling on the rooftop. She busts right through the window and goes for one kid tearing him to shreds. Another goes at her with a hammer and gets launched away. The bros run downstairs and right when getting to the front door, a head topples in front of them. They turn back towards the staircase, Sandra at the top. Brady tries to reason with her, stammering they didn't mean to hurt her. Shouldn't have given in to peer pressure, bro. And due to him staring at her, he turns into stone. The same goes for his brother, frozen in place with the camera. And Sandra, now fully in her monster form, descends upon him. Our final tape follows naive videographers Troy and Nate, who have been hired by a strange group to record some kind of ritual. They interview Kirsten, who has offered to be the vessel for it. They ask why she volunteered, and she sighs that she feels she is destined for something bigger than herself, calling it an absolute honor to offer her vessel for the god Ukaban. Sure sounds like they are a part of a witch's coven, but the guys assume it has to be some kind of joke. One woman asks if the guys are nervous about seeing a demon, and they are a bit confused. Doesn't the ritual need to be done at New Year's Eve Y2K? The woman informs them that it is true for the bigger demons. They're really practicing for the big show at the stroke of midnight when the veil between worlds is at its thinnest. Kirsten gets strapped in, flanked by the women all donned in black. They begin to chant about opening the gate, and the veil begins to slip, reaching out for Ukuban. Troy spots something strange when panning around the room, and when looking behind the TV, there's a weird goblin guy lingering there. The woman assumes that it's the lowly demon Fergus who has been messing with their rituals, taking advantage of the open dimensional door. As the women pray to make him go away, he appears under the table and grabs his leg. Their screens become distorted, and they thud into hell itself. Troy gets his bearings, and Nate is there with him too, taking in their weird new surroundings. They happen upon a mangled body in a giant trap, along with a weird staff that they take. They catch a glimpse of Fergus up on the ridge, scurrying away in the red lightning. They turn off the light and attempt to stay quiet. At the skyline, there's a massive demonic visage that flashes, causing Troy to flip. His butt attempts to get him to not panic, assuring him there's no such thing as hell. Another figure nearby waves at them. A woman, well, kind of, called Mabel. She runs right up to them, giggling bizarrely. They ask where they are, the feeding grounds, she informs them. And then she realizes they are made of flesh, making her ask which sin they committed. I mean, how else do you wind up in hell, you know? Nate figures out their ritual must have gone wrong, and when they sent Fergus back here, they got sucked along too. They try to remember the name of the demon they were actually trying to summon, and Mabel knows of Ukaban, and she is not a fan. They start a countdown to midnight, and know they have eight minutes to get back through the veil to our world. Better hurry. They ask Mabel to take them to Ukaban, and she asks in return if they make it back to Earth, will they write her name in the Great Book of Witches? They're like, uh, sure, whatever. She calls for them to follow after creatures howling nearby. As they continue through the craggy environment, Troy is curious if shoplifting is enough of a sin to go to hell. Nate scoffs, knowing him better, like that's the worst thing you've done. They can't help but wonder if Mabel is going to lead them to their demises, but Nate for some reason doesn't think so. They stumble upon a faceless girl and flee, worrying about losing Mabel. They then run into another trap and almost step right into it. Troy spins back and his hand gets caught, yowling in agony. They shout for Mabel, who's busy tearing off an arm from a dead dude on a spit. Must be hungry. She's curious why they are raising their voices, and a loud booming one is heard, commanding to the great order to return to me at once. Must be the witches preparing to do their big finale. They then hear a voice calling for help, coming to another weird, stumpy amalgamation of flesh. Pretty weird down here. They bump back into Mabel, who wants to know why it is that they are constantly screaming like cowards. He shows off his injured hand, and she tears the trap right off. With only four minutes left, they worry that they are not going to make it. However, just in time, they happen upon Ukaban's lair. Mabel orders them to crawl through the webby tunnel, but Troy can't with only one hand. She helps him out, taping the light around his Noggin. They shuffle through on their hands and knees, and approaching demonic voices motivate them to tear through the webs as quickly as possible. Inside the cave, there are people lying around along with black bottles everywhere and more weird-ass creatures, one munching down on some flesh, and another little squat dude which they steal a fork from. They continue deeper, hearing chanting ahead, and there's only 80 seconds left. They wait for the right moment to pounce, hiding behind some rocks, and are back to bickering about Troy being a terrible person. Maybe that's why he got sucked in. They make their move, slinking up silently to Ugabon, but it's ruined by Mabel shouting to not forget to write her name. Dang, you blew it! A guy tosses Nate to the ground, and creatures overtake him. He uses the small fork to get one in the neck. Another bites 
deep into his hand, and he kicks them off. The time is nigh, a voice bellows. Another attacker goes for Troy, and Nate steps in, bloodily dispatching him. He helps him to his feet, and there's only 15 seconds left. They shout for Mabel to come along, and she gets forked by another dude. They run at Ukaban, his torso opening right up. He's coming, they hear, and they appear back in our world, but not how they intended. Nate is now in Kirsten's body. The coven know the ritual didn't work out exactly as intended, and take care of the loose ends in the boys. The witches are baffled and alarmed that this happened, frantically searching for another name for the book. Troy manages to write Mabel's name in blood before fading away. We flash back to Dylan and Brady's house, seeing their stone bodies on the floor, and the camera battery dies. Then over the credits, audio clues us in that the witches did indeed find a new name to reach out to. Why, Mabel, of course, implying that she will be coming into our world after all. 97, 98, 99, 100. See? Told you. It's not even that hard. Oh. What is that noise? Oh! Oh! Shit, we gotta get out of here. I was wrong. We're all gonna die. <sighs> ah! That brings us to the conclusion of this particular curse tape in VHS 99. But stay tuned for a look at the follow-up VHS 85 coming soon. And until then, why not check out my other videos covering the rest of the series? Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.